Well, welcome everyone to Lenten Lunches. If you're watching this, uh, you're probably not watching it at lunchtime here um, on Wednesday because we actually ran into a bit of technical difficulties. So I'm, I'm recording this at lunchtime, but you're probably not seeing it right now. You're probably seeing it either Wednesday night or another day, but that's okay because whenever you get to it, that's good by me. Um, so today we're going to get... Um, get into both of our books and we have a short homily on Luke 13. So I'm just going to get right into it. We're, we're going to go right to You Are the Beloved, which is by Henry Nouwen, who is just an excellent writer and I uh, recommend him to you. So our reading for today, March 13th, is titled The Descending Way of Jesus. And it goes like this. He writes, Jesus presents to us the great mystery of the descending way. It is the way of suffering, but also the way to healing. It is the way of humiliation, but also the way of resurrection. It is the way of tears, but of tears that turn into tears of joy. It is the way of hiddenness, but also the way that leads to the light that will shine for all people. And it is the way of persecution, oppression, martyrdom, and death, but also the way to f the full disclosure of God's love. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, As Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. John 3, verses 14 to 15. You see in these words how the descending way of Jesus becomes the ascending way. The lifting up that Jesus speaks of refers both to his being raised up in the cross, on the cross, in total humiliation, and to his being raised up from the dead in total glorification. Each one of us has to seek out his or her own way of descending, of the descending way of love. That calls for much prayer much patience and much guidance it has nothing at all to do with spiritual heroics dramatically throwing everything overboard to follow jesus the descending way is a way that is concealed in each person's heart because it is so seldom walked on it is often overgrown with weeds slowly but surely we have to clear the weeds open the way and set out on it, unafraid. The reading from Henry Nouwen. So now we're going to transition to our prayer book. Um, let me just give me one second here. So this uh, prayer book is written by Jessa McRoberts and Scott Erickson. And what's unique about this prayer book is that it actually contains images and artwork that are meant to um, stimulate you, they're meant to provoke thought and, and feeling. But I'm going to let the authors kind of explain a bit about this book. So I'm going to actually set this up by reading their prelude to the images that we're going to look at together and the prayers that we will pray together. So this is from, from their prelude, their introduction chapter, and they, they write about contemplative imagery, and this is what they write. They say, Scott and I wanted to create something that invites you to do far more than simply read what is written and agree or disagree. The design of this book is an invitation to stop, listen, see, recognize, and contemplate your life. The lives of those you love, the presence of God in, through, and all around all of it. That kind of contemplation takes what Scott likes to call an excavation of the soul. The kind of digging that good art invites us to do. In Scott's words, we've all read a book that has pictures in it. Most likely the illustrations creatively visualize the words being communicated in the story. If it was a children's book, the images did all the heavy lifting to keep your attention. That's how most of us experience imagery. But I don't think that that's what these images in this book are for. I think imagery is another language entirely. 
Neuroscientist Dr. Andrew Newberg agrees, writing in his book, How God Changes Your Brain. <coughs> Drawing is a form of communication that is neurologically distinct from writing and speech. In essence, words and pictures are two integrated elements of language, and most words have an image quality associated with them. If the right hemisphere is in injured, words and pictures lose their meaning. He continues, words are not enough to describe a spiritual experience. Prayer is a conversation about everything. Words and images are vital tools that can help us grow in this endless and ongoing conversation. But we must understand that the words and images we use are not the content itself. They are the excavation tools that help us dig towards and into the real content. The ongoing, ever-present conversation between us and the divine. Scott has often been asked what his paintings mean. And while questions of intrinsic meaning can lead to interesting conversations, perhaps a better question about visual art is, what does this piece draw out of you. Henry Nouwen's remarkable book, The Return of the Prodigal Son, is a retelling of his interactions with Rembrandt's iconic work by the same name. Rather than centering the book on what can be found in the painting, Nouwen shares the ways Rembrandt's book work dug into and unearthed pieces of his soul, helping him see things in himself in, himself in need of repair as well as things healed and in the process of restoration. May the imagery contained in this book be the same gift to you. So here's what we're going to do, my beloved listeners. We are going to actually go through each one of these images found in this here prayer book. And uh, you're going to see them to the screen to my right. And I'm going to read the prayer that is right next to it. And then I'm going to just have a moment of silence and let you stare at the image and, and, and let, it, let it provoke you. Let it contend with who you are. Sit with it. And after about 30, 40 seconds, I'll move on to the next image. So here we go. So here's the prayer. May love be stronger in me than the fear of the pain that comes with caring. May love be stronger in me than the fear of the pain that comes with caring. May I cease to be annoyed that others are not as I wish they were, since I'm not as I wish I was. May I have vision and courage to join God in the places he's already working, rather than feel responsible for bringing him with me. May the reality that I cannot know the whole truth never keep me from bearing witness to what I can and do see. Last one. 
may I have the courage to believe that everything I do matters. Okay, that concludes our time in Scott uh, Erickson and Justin McRoberts' prayer book. I'm going to read more from that uh, next week. Uh, right now, we're actually going to move on to our last section of Lenten lunches, which is uh, the reading of scripture. And then I have a short reflection on that, and I'll let you go after that. So here we go. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox. I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks underneath her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, but I tell you, I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Luke thirteen thirty one to thirty five. So here in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is on his long journey towards Jerusalem. Three chapters earlier, we're actually told by Luke that Jesus has set his face towards Jerusalem. This, this is what we call. Jesus's way of the cross. This was the path to inevitable pain, loss, and suffering. And I say inevitable because it seems everybody in knows that Jesus's movement is heading towards a confrontation with the powers that be. Even Plato, 350 years prior, had predicted that if there ever was truly a just person, that person would inevitably face torture by death and crucifixion why why does even plato know this well i think it's because we intrinsically understand that this world understands that we cannot contend with true beauty true justice and true truth such a person would actually challenge us far too much they would wake us from our systems of deception, denial, and destruction. And so here in our passage, the Pharisees, who are not the biggest fans of Jesus, even they warn him that Herod wants to kill him. And Jesus' response is telling. He doesn't shy away from the reality of the situation. He doesn't practice denial. Instead, Jesus speaks as one needing to complete a mission. It's a mission that deeply identifies with the prophetic tradition of which Jesus is the culmination. It's a mission that Jesus says will be completed on the third day, which is a subtle reference to the resurrection on the third day. The resurrection that vindicates the lamb who was slain. Now, in our passage today, we actually hear lament. Jesus makes a striking prediction of his death and resurrection. And then in verse 34, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks underneath her wings, and you were not willing. There it is. A lament. Here Jesus is giving us an image of a farm hen and how these animals actually have a response to raging fires. So it's an actual phenomenon that has been documented. 
And the phenomenon is that a mother hen would gather her chicks underneath her wings and suffer the flames of the fire. And in fact, there are actual stories of people cleaning up farmyard fires and discovering dead hens, scorched and blackened. And then as they lift up the dead hen, they would find live chicks sheltering underneath the wings. Mother hens literally give their lives for the life of their children. And this is what Jesus tells us he is doing. Jesus is like a mother hen who longs to gather his chicks together and save them from fire. But here's the lament. And, and I picture Jesus saying this with tears and weeping. He says, you were not willing. You were not willing. Imagine that. Imagine Jesus just lamenting and saying these words. Because instead of accepting his saving ministry, Jerusalem, which is a symbol for the entire country, well, they chose to go their own way. Jerusalem would give this son of David not a proper crown, but a crown of thorns. Jerusalem would enthrone him upon the hardwood of the cross. And in doing this, they would be the chicks that choose not to run to their mother hen for help, but instead into the flames and the foxes like Herod. I think a startling truth of this passage is that for whatever reason, God always gives us the ability to reject him. God honors our decisions and their consequences and even more sobering god will let us bring desolation upon our houses but we should not think that this is the choice of god god is like jesus and jesus makes his his position clear he is the one who wants to save And he is the one that laments our choice to go our own way. So today, where are you making the choice to go your own way? Where in your life are you going against the grain of love and suffering the shards of self-inflicted harm? Where today are you just not willing Because the promise in our text today is that Jesus longs to gather you under his wings. Jesus longs to protect you from the deepest pain. And so today, may I say this to you. May you turn to Jesus, the Savior and Lord. Today, may you confess that you need shelter from the fire and the foxes. Today, may you confess the sacred words, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. All right, everyone, see you next week.